eventually scholars got to work and they bought up all the texts and compiled them back into what is now called the Nakamani Library. And anybody can read it in English. Um, the translation, the editing is by James and, and Robinson. There are many translators. These are amazing texts. I, I mean, they're not easy to read at all. And they, they have very complex language. But I would highly recommend any, anybody who is pursuing uh, the mysteries to read the Gnostic texts. They're just fundamental readings in this, in this area. And as I've drawn up on the screen there, this idea is a coherent system that are characterized by an absolutely negative view of the visible world and its creator. And the assumption of a divine spark in man, his inner self, which had become enclosed within the material body as a result of a tragic event in the pre cosmic world, from which it, typographical error, from which it can only escape to its divine origin by means of the saving gnosis. And uh, so this is the Gnostic view of the, the Gnostic duality that there's the spiritual realm and there's the material realm. And they kind of touch at the edges, but they don't interconnect. In the Gnostic view, all matter is evil, only spirit is good. And the world of matter is the world of darkness and wickedness. Uh, our true essence was purely spiritual, but as a result of this cosmic accident, which involves that the aeons are the if you like, the divinities of the Gnostic system. And one of them, Sophia, falls into matter. That is the, the idea of the cosmic accident. It's never really explained why Sophia has this fall. And in her fall, in her, in her terror, in her confusion, she creates a thing called the Demiurge. And the Demiurge, in turn, creates the Earth. And he creates mankind. And he creates Archons, who are the evil angels who are to keep mankind in place. But Sophia takes pity on this creation and she inserts a spark of divinity into mankind. And that spark of divinity can be freed through gnosis, through revealed knowledge. The moment you get it, you understand what's going on on this prison planet. Um, you, you can begin to escape from it. And this is why the Gnostics were burnt at the stake. Because in their scheme of things, the Demiurge is Yahweh. He is the God that we have been taught. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all worship that God. Um, they see him, as I said on the bus, as, as a kind of demon who has conned us into believing that he is God and conned us into acting out uh, his horrors and fantasies. And that's why if we read particularly the Old Testament, he is a, a jealous God, an envious God, a cruel God, instructs the destruction of nations. Um, a very violent, uh, violent creature, that horrible game that he plays with Abraham and Isaac, you know, go kill your son, you know, sac go sacrifice your son to me. I mean, what, what, kind, of, what kind of God actually would do that? Uh, and then at the last minute, reprieves and sends the ram to be sacrificed instead. So from the Gnostic point of view, this Demiurge um, is, is the author of, of all troubles in the world. And what we need to do is nourish this divine spark in ourselves and, and uh, resist the controlling power of the archons who often take human form and mingle with us and, and mislead us, uh, take us down the wrong track, keep, keep us locked in matter, imprisoned in matter, never to realize the spiritual part of ourselves. Uh, but it's very important to emphasize that the Gnostics had a high reverence for Christ. And they did regard themselves as Christians. And they were the first Christians, as a matter of fact. And for them, Christ was a great Gnostic teacher. And he wasn't physically, could not be physical. Uh, because physical is evil. He was more like in the form of a vision or an apparition. And, and they regarded it as absurd, that th this notion that he died for our sins. Because we have to be responsible for our own sins. Uh, we can't hand that, we can't hand, we can't torture it this God-man on a, on a cross and, and make all our sins okay. We have, to, we have to take responsibility for our sins. We have to actually know good and evil and make, and make choices. We can't just devolve that onto, onto Christ. So for, 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 for they took a very different view of what Christ was, but they did regard themselves as Christians. They were one of many factions of Christianity that existed in the Roman Empire at that time. It just happened that another of those factions were extreme literalists and they became the Roman Catholic Church. 
So the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, um, what is the tree? The tree is the knowledge of good and evil. And, and uh, the Gnostics turn this whole story upside down. They see the serpent as the good guy. The serpent is telling Adam and Eve, you need to know good and evil. You can't just exist in this, in this um, state of ignorant bliss. You have, to, you have to know good and evil. If you are to free the divine spark in yourself, you've got to free it through the, through the revelation of knowledge and through the, through the choices that you make. So quite the opposite of how we find it in the, in the biblical text. The, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent is the good guy for the Gnostics. And we know what happens in the Garden of Eden, that, that Adam and Eve eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the Demiurge, as the Gnostics see it, or God, according to the monotheistic faith, drives them out of the garden. And the, the very humiliating uh, scene, you know, sort of being beaten on the bottom by angels here. <laughs> naughty, naughty <laughs> Go away. Go and suffer forever. How dare you? How dare you? seek knowledge of good and evil. Goodness knows, next thing you'll be doing, you'll be looking for the tree of life. Yes. And then, you may become gods, like us. That's the weird thing in Genesis, you may become gods like us. us. Who are us? What is, what is going on here? 